Hello, Jackie and three. Welcome to the Hidden Wire Podcast. Great, we could connect. A few technical difficulties this morning, but we're here. That's right. <laughs> well, Lee, thank you. I've got to tell you, we were so honored uh, to have the opportunity to be able to speak with you. We've done a little bit of research, very interested in all the things that you're involved with, and can't tell you how excited we are to be able to uh, talk to you today. Oh, the, the privilege is all mine, mate, getting to speak to people like yourself with lots of expertise in different fields and um, helping others too through through that information, you know. Um, it's all about personal growth here and, you know, finding more passion and purpose in our lives. And I suppose, um, I think everything has a crossover and certainly your work and your backgrounds um, will have some value for us as well. So you've just launched or you're just about to launch your, your book, which you've written together. That must be a hard task in itself. Um, <laughs> People first, uh, and that's going to launch what in a couple of days? You said October yeah, the fifth. Yeah, on Tuesday, October fifth. Yep. Yeah. So tell us um, what. Give us a little bit of a glimpse into your background and how you guys, I guess, met. Because I, I have a feeling you maybe met through your your various careers. Um, oh, we did. You did. You're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So no, uh, Jackie and I have spent our entire careers in the hospitality industry, and more specifically in the private club world. Uh, I started as a kid. I grew up really, really close to my hometown club uh, in Iowa, in central Iowa. And then um, Jackie had started in kind of a small town working uh, also in hospitality, worked at a little restaurant bar. And and by the time she was, you know, uh, in college, she was uh, very honestly kind of doing every facet of what that operation was. We met uh, when Jackie was in college and ultimately uh, both of us had – a lot of experience within the club world and, and found uh, we worked together really incredibly well and had mm. the opportunity to work together at a couple of clubs around the U.S. Yeah, and we're still married, so uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> For how long? 20 years, was it? No, uh, nine. <laughs> nine, okay. That's, that's there. It's up there. <laughs> Probably above the average, I guess. Huh? The um, So that's really cool. So you've gone into the hospitality industry. People first is all about the people. Um, and I guess that comes because you, you talk about being um, highly service focused, but a lot of people think service is more to external customers, not your internal customers, like mm-hmm. your people, like your staff. But um, do you guys differentiate there in the book about those two facets or do you just, it's all related? Yeah, um, in some ways. I mean, really, the crux of the book is that it's very normal, I guess, for most businesses to be really focused on their customers, right? They're outward people because that's where they think their money's coming from. Yeah. And we look at that and say, actually, what you want to do is flip that around. If you want to be successful and have the cutting edge, you want to focus everything you do on your employees because they're the ones that are impacting your customers. They're the ones taking care of them. So um, mm. I think it's Richard Bronson who said, um, if you want your, if you take care of your employees, they'll take care of your customers so and we strongly believe that makes a lot of sense doesn't it it does yeah it does and we've we've seen how that how that works yeah well i think you know no matter how dynamic any one leader in 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 any type of industry but in any business is there's still just that one person and ultimately you know i think where we've tried to have you know good success in, in you know the hospitality world especially you know private clubs are you know high end experience high end personal touch Um, you know, reoccurring customers all the time because it's the same people coming back and forth. You know, you really have to be able to get everyone on your team being able to um, deliver those high levels levels, because obviously one person can't make that happen no matter who it is. So you got to get that buy-in from from the whole team. I guess it depends on the the company that you're running and and all that. Um, Mm -hmm. But you've got to relay somehow that mission to them so they've got the same sort of vibe as as where you want to go. Exactly, exactly. So people first is really about um, how you put your employees first and you get the focus away from profit and you just really focus on your people and developing them and nurturing them and coaching them and creating an environment where they have a purpose, right? And they are feeling engaged and um, and happy with what they're doing. Because when you get people, when you have employees that are excited about coming to work, that's when your company thrives, right? Mm. That's when your company is successful is when your employees are excited about what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The... Um... Is the customer always right? Well, in our world, <laughs> in private clubs, yes. 
because <laughs> they're paying a lot of money to be there. So they're kind of always right. Yeah. You know, we were just doing a training and obviously members own the facilities that, you know, that we, we work, work at. So each member is, you know, one small part of an owner. So it does put them in that mindset of this is kind of my business. And um, yes, the member's always right. But the reality of that is there's to a point, though. Right. And as you start to empower and really build strong teams of people, we have found that those people have the ability to um, diffuse a situation where a member is probably actually wrong and actually try to lead them you know, to a more um, positive uh, response and be able to still kind of control that, that outcome. Yeah. Hmm. I guess you're finding a lot of, I've come from a retail background and, Certainly an experience I found a lot of uh, leadership or, or upper management not supporting their staff um, when they were trying to guide or coach, you know, customers because the customer in particular situations weren't right and they just support the customer over the staff and that certainly doesn't help the culture, I don't think. No, no. Yeah, we're we're firm believers in the opposite and you really, you know, support your staff and build them up in those kinds of things. Not that, you know, the customer isn't right, but it's just yeah. it's a different kind of a culture and morale. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've developed and it's, it's outlined in this book, the five step um, roadmap, I suppose, to creating, you know, positive, passionate, purposeful driven employees and really good work cultures. Can you run us through this five step process? And we absolutely. can go on to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the first step is building credibility, um, is credibility. And that really comes in the recruiting phase where you've got to be the employer brand is kind of a, a buzzword these days where I think companies have realized they can't just have a customer brand. They have to also be having a employer brand. Um, and so it's really being truth worthy and um, trust, you, put, you know, be trustful and truth telling the truth and really being um, valid authentic. and authentic in the eyes of your employees. Mm. And then the second step is candor. And that kind of comes in, um, especially during the hiring phase, is being open and honest and really telling people what it is like to work in your organization versus I think sometimes companies try to hide certain things or, you know, maybe hoodwink you, you know, to get you get you in the company. And that's not the way to go about it. So it really takes kind of open and honest communication. Um, the third step is then cultivation. So once you hire the great people and you bring them in, you want to cultivate them. Um, the first 90 days, we found that a lot of companies often look at those um, 90 days as sort of a sink or swim period, you know, you got to weed out the weak ones. And we're here to say that's not the way you want to look at that. If you look at it as how can we best support you and coach you and nurture you and help you learn as fast as possible, um, it's going to be better in the long run. And that person's going to be more loyal and more invested in your organization. Um, I don't know if you know this, Lee, but nobody likes to feel stupid. No. Um, so if you can help new employees not feel stupid, right, and help get them up to speed as quickly as possible, they're going to they're going to be better off. Um, the fourth step then is commitment. And that's really showing your people that you're committed to their growth, that you're committed to them. And in return, they can be committed to you and be loyal to you as an as an employer. Um, and that's all about really helping them take ownership of their role. So, again, that nurturing, coaching, um, connecting, really building relationships with employees and empowering them. And then the last step is care. And care is exactly what it says. It's about genuinely caring for your people. It's about being grateful for their work. Um, it's about showing recognition and reward and just really continuing to develop and nurture them. Well, and, and outside of work as well, you know, one yeah. of the things that I think maybe ties a lot to some of the things that, that as we've researched you, Lee, you know, we look at, at the idea that we want people to be great at work, obviously, because there's a great benefit to our entire business and everything that we're doing. But we also want to be able to help inspire and lead people to, you know, exceed beyond their own expectations, quite frankly, not just at work, but in their personal lives and as they mm -hmm. grow and, and not even necessarily with our companies that we've been involved with. I can't tell you how frequently both of us, you know, still work with many, 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 many of, uh, you know, former friends and employees that we've had the opportunity and, and blessed life to work with. But now we work in completely different uh, businesses, different industries, but we're still very, very well connected to them. We want them to be successful. We want them to be successful, you know, having really brilliant intention in their life. 
uh, whether it is in a marriage or it's with their siblings or any part of their personal life, but obviously, you know, within their, their work side too. So it's a real balance that we were really trying to help people yeah. grow and understand who they are. Yeah, we're really just trying to kind of create a movement for um, companies and organizations to be more about people working together at life versus just working together at work. So if we can create kind of these uplifting, um, positive work experiences, you know, company cultures where people are, you know, happy and passionate about what they're doing and having, you know, using their purpose and things like that. Um, we just think it's, it's not only better for the organization, but it's better for people in general. You know, just a quick side story to that. And so we, at one of the clubs that we worked at in Texas, we had the opportunity to build one of the largest collegiate internship programs in, in the private club industry. And it was an interesting thing because we would bring in, you know, about 10 really outstanding, you know, uh, college students um, from around the U.S. and have them come work with us. And, of course, we taught them the business. I mean, obviously, you know, that's a big piece. You want to teach them those skills. But the reality of it was, and, and the thing that I think that we now spend a lot of time, and it's, it's something we talk about a little bit in the book, when those interns came, you know, teaching them to do the hospitality skills, you know, wasn't the outcome that we wanted them to have at the end. The outcome was we wanted them to know who they were. And it's a funny thing because I mm. played a game with all the interns all the time, and I would do it in the most kind of awkward positions. You know, all of a sudden, maybe an intern had walked up to a table and maybe was waiting that table because that was part of their learning of, you know, our fundamental skills. And I would walk up and, and I would say something to the table and I would look at, you know, whoever that potential intern was. And I would say, well, hey, Nick, while you're here, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself? What makes you special? What makes you, you know, the best intern here? And I put them in a really kind of awkward spot. But we would do this in places like that. We would do it when the interns were together. We would do it later on in time. And the idea of that was uh, to give them. Uh, an idea of who they were and what they could accomplish in life well beyond just, you know, what we did. Hmm. It was more than just developing good interns, right? It was more about helping develop them as people. As people, yeah, which it should, should be about. I know um, there's always been that divide, hasn't there, between we will train you in work and skills here. Outside of this, we don't really care about you. And it, I guess it shows yeah. a, a lack of compassion towards your people. Yeah. Um, I actually remember I had a um, a uh, an appraisal, no, appraisal, what do you call them? I can't even think now. Apprentice. Um, oh, apprentice. No, no, no. I had an, a, uh, a, an interview, not an interview. I had a review with my boss. Oh, yeah. A review. Yeah. What do you call them? Um, not just a review. There's another word for it. Anyway, um, and I sat down with him and I, I told him the goals that I had for my, my stores and, and the goals that I had for, my, uh, for myself. And he sort of stood back and he, he smiled and he said, oh, I appreciate that, but that's really not what we're here about. Um. But this was this was a while wow. back, you know. And I thought, oh. mm -hmm. and I never, I just brushed it aside and said, okay, that's my ignorance, whatever. Um, but it's so important. Like, if you can help people be better themselves, then they're going to show up better for you anyway. Like, mm -hmm. makes total sense. Yeah, we actually talk about this in the book, uh, Lee. It's not just about equipping or you know. Um, we actually call it like outfitting the employee, you're really fully dressing someone, right? You want to give them the soft skills and the hard skills that they need. You want to help develop them to be, you know, continue to grow and learn. We want to hear those goals, right, of what they want to achieve. And even if that's outside our four walls, well, that's okay. We want to, you know, make you the best that you can be while you're here. And then maybe we'll help you find what's next, right? And even if it's another company or a competitor, but too many companies don't think about it that way. Well, and I think, you know, that piece, we've, we've had good success with that, where people will come to us, they, they know they can be authentic, they can tell us that, hey, they think they want to be in a different type of industry, they want to look at a new opportunity, whatever that is. And even though sometimes that's a setback for us in our business, the businesses, we would work hard to, to help them through that. And by doing so, you know, what that's created. Come back tenfold. Oh, I mean, it absolutely has, yeah. Because those people go and tell other people why you're a great place to work, right? Yeah. They care about you. They want you to be more than just working there, you know, punching the clock, right? Yeah, yeah. And you can see that when you walk into those organizations that do care for their people. The people are passionate and fired up. I know there's a local um, restaurant here in town, and it's just amazing. They've got a bunch of people that work there. A lot of them are, are, are women, and they're just passionate. They're bubbly. They're, you know, talkative. And it's always impressed me. I'm just like, how do they? How have they done this? They, they're just really hard workers because it's it's seemingly hard to find sometimes those hard workers. But these guys all seem to work hard. At the same time, they seem to be enjoying it. You know, 
Mm. Um, so it really comes across to the customer. I think that makes the customer then feel really comfortable being there. It's an energy. And, you know, we've been very fortunate to, you know, have been uh, able to experience it a number of times in the different, in our example, country clubs that we've worked at. And boy, that energy is so contagious and it's contagious up and down and sideways to everyone. Uh, And then obviously it really uh, helps when you have members and guests, those folks can feel it, you know, just like you're talking about when you walk into a restaurant that carries that. Yeah, and it's really, I mean, when you invest in your people, then they invest in you, right? And we we came up with this kind of value begets value, right? So if you make people feel valued, they're going to feel that way and produce value in return. And that's, we we think a lot of companies and a lot of executives kind of get that backwards, right? We think that employees are tools used to build a profit. And really, if you can flip that around and really invest in them and, and show them that you care and that you're valued, they're going to produce that value back for you. It'll take care of itself. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So you guys now work with organizations, companies, clubs to help them instill this culture. And, yeah, and exactly. Do better yep. for their people. Um, what are some of the, because I can't imagine that all employees are going to be that way inclined. Like you can't, you know, maybe there's not employees that are just suitable for that job. Maybe their passion's not there. Maybe their head's not there. I don't know. Maybe they're just disgruntled and I don't know, whatever. Can you transform any, transform anyone? Or is it a case where you have to sometimes assess people and say, look, you know, really support them, but this isn't for you. See you later. Well, I think, you know, a little of both, you know, for us, we have found people that transform when they sort of catch the buzz of it, you know, they get the energy and they start to feel it and they, they become someone that you almost didn't realize was possible. But to your point, Lee, there certainly are times when people are just absolutely in the wrong fit for, you know, who they are and what they're really looking for. And it is interesting. We find that very rarely because most people want to be part of something that's kind of fun and has some enthusiasm and excitement. And so people pretty quickly buy into that culture. And even people that uh, maybe haven't done well with that in the past, sometimes maybe not um, the particular business or the style of industry like hospitality might not really be for them, but that energy and that thing that kind of happens uh, is pretty contagious. So people want to be part of that pretty quick. And being part of a team, you know, where you feel supported and cared about, and it's not just you working alone. Like if you have a question, you can ask your coworker that can be like, Hey, I have a question. They're not going to be like, Oh, I'm busy. Leave me alone. You know? Right. Instead they're like, Oh my gosh, yeah, let me help you. What can I help you with? Right. Like Hmm. that's refreshing. That's energizing instead of feeling like, you know, you can't talk to anybody or ask for help. Right. Yeah, yeah. I have an example where I was a operations manager for a major retailer, um, new store, and we had to recruit. Um, we recruited in the end approximately 230 people. And um, it was all about the culture, you know, the people and, and the values. And we did that so well, we felt I was part of that. I was integral to that development of that culture. And as soon as the doors opened to the store, um, the profits or the expected forecast profits weren't there. So suddenly upper management changed the, you know, the goalposts right. and and that culture and the people piece just went to the side and it was all about getting the profits and uh, no one wanted to listen to the people anymore mm. um, they just wanted to cut the staff cut the hours which didn't help anyone because that creates a poor culture whether you're the one being cut or not it um, is not right. good and it was it was quite astonishing to see the transformation from a really positive culture that was there for at least six months to a culture that just went sour very quickly um, a real shame and then that company big company is no longer, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We say that um, culture has a shelf life of a banana because it really changes rapidly. And mm. so, you know, people <laughs> first is a philosophy, it's a mindset and it's gotta be a priority every day because if it's not people very quickly pick up on that and the culture goes downhill, just like you explained in a, in a matter of months, it can even be weeks or days and the culture changes completely. Yeah. What are some of the key challenges you find going into an organization? And and I guess it depends on the size, perhaps, but are there some challenges that always come up that you notice or identify? Well, you know, I I would say that the thing that's consistent is that people, um, a lot of times, the leadership examples that you see, people uh, get their kind of eye off the ball a little bit and all of a sudden are very focused on profit and forget kind of what got them there. And that whole idea of that strong staff and that strong culture, you know, that, you know, foundationally built these businesses. And you think of 
businesses like Apple or Google or any of that that started with a small group of people and then really, really exploded up, they still started with this really brilliant foundation, right? Yeah. And I think that you see that that piece you know, is key. But boy, I got to tell you, we see so many businesses that have all of a sudden gotten so concerned about cutting expenses or just the bottom line and only on the financial piece of the business. And they completely forget about what matters. You know, here in the U.S., Southwest Airlines obviously is, you know, awfully well known for having a very unique, interesting culture. But boy, that started from the very, very uh, beginning with Herb Kelleher and his entire team as they built that entity and then they have continued to do that all the way through. Disney is a brilliant example of that. Yeah. yeah and um, another thing we um, we've found at a lot of companies, there's a disconnect. So the CEOs and the high level, uh, you know, department heads and managers um, believe that they are people first. They, that's happening. All these things are going the way it is. And then you go and ask like the line level people or the very low level managers. And they're like, no way we're not people for like none of these things are happening so there's this big gap there's this disconnect where mm. the, the people high up believe yeah it's all good they're just assuming um but they're not really doing a great job of teaching the lower levels and developing those people and really showing them how to care about people i know this sounds really silly but in the business world people don't believe that they can be good people or that they can care about people right we've sort of been programmed that like i can't care about you outside of work or i don't i don't want to hear your personal stuff right like i we, we're here to do a, to do a job um and it's sad really because they're missing out on a lot of those pieces so there is a big disconnect with a lot of companies mm. yeah that must be a, a very yeah common thing i imagine because i've seen that myself where there is that disconnect um, is it because there's just a lack of communication flow and or just uh yeah i think really what it is is a lot of assumptions are made and i also think that everyone's just busy like people have good intentions or you know they, they think it's happening they think they're doing all the things they mm. need to do but they've got 700 emails to answer right like everybody's running from one thing to the next and somehow we've just all kind of gotten lost on what's really important and what's really what really matters and so there's not a lot of follow-up and follow through um, and that's kind of where it kind of goes by the wayside. Yeah, that's a good point. I think a lot of the good things that we need to spend time on are time consuming, which mm, is why we yeah. try and dodge them and take shortcuts like planning and, and spending time talking to people, like talking to people that takes time and I'm an impatient guy, you know, so right. I, um, you know, you've got to do it. Yeah. I don't... And it's prioritizing that right there. Exactly. Yeah. And actually, there I don't know if you've um, heard this study, um, Lee, but the London Business School did a study fairly recently. This, they did several studies, but they merged it all together in this one report. And they, it was about the pandemic and how that's impacted with people working remotely and all these things. And essentially what they found was managers that are working remotely actually became more efficient um, because there's, you know, no water cooler talk as they talk about no one's walking in their office and interrupting them. Um, but the sad part was, and as people first people, this really gives us anxiety <laughs> is that it's because they become more focused on tasks and less focused on people and their staff said, yeah, we're not getting coached. We're not getting feedback. We're not getting any of these things. Nobody's talking about goals and my personal and professional, you know, professional development, like nothing's happening. Everyone's just checking stuff off the list, you know, yeah. which is, is sad. So the managers need to get used to the new platforms that we have to have those people relationships through, like Zoom yeah, you gotta, calls. And yeah, you have to really have the intention that you're going to, you know, hey, we're going to schedule a call that we can, you know, really talk about you and develop you or we're going to really have a coaching session today. You know what I mean? Like you have to be more intentional about it because it's a lot harder to be organic, I guess, when it's, you know, over the computer. <laughs> Do you find um, when you're talking to upper management or, or CEOs um, and trying to, put this new idea across and they have difficulty accepting it like challenges or do they sort of understand it? And No, you know what I think it is. I think it is that people realize they should be doing it. And when reminded of the incredible importance, and especially when you start talking about some of the studies and things with COVID and the way some of those things have changed our society, you know, over the course of the last, you know, two years, I think they remember quickly how important it is and, and start to spend some time refocusing towards it, or at least trying to prioritize with some of their other people how important it is that these things get developed. And especially today where, where employees, especially with the you know two years of the COVID period, um, employees really want to be connected. And I think that, that piece today, they're hungry for it. Yeah, definitely. Mm. 
Yeah, sometimes I think as a uh, leader myself, um, yeah, we do just make assumptions of the people and and feel that certain things may be not necessary, even though they're sort of maybe not directly asking for it, but they're in indirect ways sort of asking for things. And maybe we should listen to that and go, okay, hang on, maybe there's something here. Particularly if you've got a large, large organization and you're hearing it in a few different sources, you know, it might be an area for you to focus on. Yeah, well, and I think this sounds terrible to say, but I think some people have kind of forgotten how to connect yeah. kind of forgotten how you show employees you care like what's really important um and this is embarrassingly but it took us five years to write this book <laughs> um we both have full-time jobs we have two little kids um but the one of the reasons it took us so long to write this is because we didn't want to write a book that said hey you need to do this hey you need to do this hey you need to do this and you get to the end of the book and you go that's awesome i need to do this but i don't know how to do it Hmm. Um, so this book actually tells you how all of those five steps that we rattled off, um, this book has action steps. So okay. anybody in any organization can impact change. So it doesn't matter if you're not the CEO, if, if you are a low level manager, you're even an entry level position, there are things you can do to change your company culture and to start kind of a movement, really start changing the fabric of your organization towards people first. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. That's what we want. The actionable steps, huh? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because we just kind of look at it, Lee, because um, here's here's sort of our 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 hidden our hidden why. Okay, uh, here is and why we wrote the book was um, we just look at the world and we've been we've been blessed to be part of these kinds of kind of connected teams, right? We've been we've been part of this and we've seen how it's impacted people's lives forever, yeah. like beyond when they're just working there, right? And we look at the world and we say, oh, my gosh, what is possible for this world if people were happier at work? Because there's dozens of studies out there that show if people are happier at work, they're happier in their outside of work, you know, in their personal lives. And if people are treated better at work, they treat their families better. They treat customers better. They treat, you know, the community better. And so we look at it and say, you know, if people were happier and more fulfilled and engaged and valued at work and they were cared about, what would we have as many suicides? Would we have such a mental health crisis that we're having? Would we have mass shootings? Like we think those numbers would really go down and what an impact this could have. It's kind of beyond just an individual company. It's more of this, you know, more of a bigger movement, right? Mm -hmm. Do you find, because it went from this industrial sort of, you know, employee employer relationship, mm -hmm. which was very much task focused to this profit, you know, right. based. And then we transformed to this, very much emotionally engaging and, you know, really nurture and almost baby our employees. Um, and I think it went too far maybe that way. Do you, do you find that? Like it's just like we give everything and and then they just become entitled almost? Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, without question. And, you know, I think one of the things there is just trying to teach people because you're exactly right. We're seeing that a lot and, and not to stereotype certainly, but, you know, in our organizations we hire you know, pretty young uh, folks in some of our uh, different roles. And there is no question that um, some of the people that have worked in our industry over the years, you know, really help us to guide them and educate them on, you know, what it takes and a little bit more energy and effort and things that they're going to have to do, you know, to be successful. Uh, yep. uh, it, it does scare me, you know, the entitlement uh, mm -hmm. kind of mentality that sometimes does exist. But I also think even those folks get very inspired to be part of something that is going well and they feel they want to be part of a winning team kind of mindset pretty quickly they also evolve and grow into what you expect yeah with mm -hmm. the right you know framework there right like you set the expectation this is what we expect we're going to hold you know help you and hold you accountable to that um and i think everybody kind of wants that. I mean, most people do because it makes them better, right? You, you bring out their best when people are challenged and pushed and encouraged. So um, it's definitely worth it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And that feedback piece too, you know, a lot of um, people want that feedback, but right. I mean, is there too Especially much feedback? Younger I don't generation. know. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, do they? Younger yeah. people want more feedback? Yeah. And it's interesting. The younger generations, actually, they want more feedback and they want it more often, which is wow. interesting. Um, they want to really know how they're doing. And so they're looking for bosses um, and managers, you know, who are going to have more of those feedback conversations. So you were talking about your review. Um, that's fine. They don't but they don't want that once a year. They want it like quarterly or even monthly. They want to know how they're doing, which is a total departure from how a lot of managers are used to operating. Right. Do you think that's a part to do with our, our um, uh, bombardment with uh, reward 
yeah. pleasure center instant activities, you know, instant. Is that <laughs> <Yeah>. why? <coughs> Probably. I mean, to some degree, I'm not sure I know, you know, exactly the reason if it's just, you know, how, how, you know, generations have evolved over time. But I think the instant gratification piece is definitely part of it. Yeah. Who doesn't want to be feel good? Like you want to feel valued, you want to feel good. So the more people who can tell you that more often, that's going to help you, you know, you're happy chemicals sort of in place but i don't know if that's maybe the best thing because maybe they then become a little bit complacent too with too much and i'm not sure uh look really interesting and and the pandemic at the moment you touched on a good point about managers and how they communicate with employees and perhaps becoming more task focused than people focused um what else are you seeing and and what else do you predict is going to happen with this the the change in lifestyle that this pandemic has has ultimately caused uh, well, we can tell you from the hospitality world after, you know, a year of people not really working nights and weekends and holidays, yeah. uh, people don't want to do that anymore. I mean, it's been a, it's been a hard summer, um, especially in the States, like with labor and finding people that want to work, um, especially nights and weekends. So I think we're going to have to really humanize our work and, you know, have some give and take where we're creating opportunities for people to work oh, in yeah. places that, you know, it's, it's, you know, the people have families, right? And they want to spend time with their families or they don't want to work isn't the only thing anymore, right? Like people want that work-life balance. I don't know what oh, else yeah. would you say. That's a really good point. So you think that because of the pandemic, people going home and not being able to work, particularly in those fields where you do work weekends and nights, yep. which, um, you know, I used to work in hospitality too, and, and I, I'm glad I don't do it anymore because how would I have <laughs> the life that I have? I still work six days a week mostly, but... Um, I've got more balance to have time with the family at night and some weekends off and things like that. Um, so that shift in, in is noticeable, huh? Yeah, definitely. And people are wanting even, to jump back you know, into industries it. like retail and stuff like that, like yeah. you know, holidays, nights, weekends, like they're struggling to get people because people don't want to do that anymore. They've kind of looked at life. I mean, we're seeing there's a yeah. big sort of reevaluation, right, of your What's work important. where yeah. people are really looking at that and saying, like, is this really what I want to be doing? Is this really what yeah. I want for me? And if it's not, they're shopping elsewhere, you know, for another job. It's interesting, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Well, look, thank you for coming on, guys. I really appreciate your time. Lots more in the book, uh, of course, and those five steps broken down even further with actionable takeaways for, for the readers. Um, so all the best with the launch. I appreciate oh, your time today. You. Yeah, thank, thank you, Lee. you we so much. It. This is awesome. Thank you. So, guys, listening, I hope you've enjoyed it. You can check it out, episode 1008 on the Hidden Wide uh, podcast, and you can check that out at thehiddenwide.com. Until next time, peace, passion, and purpose. See you soon.